Hi, everyone. This is Rachel Reyes. Um, if, we'll be starting just in two more minutes. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, oh, there's a slight echo. Is that it? Okay, I think we've lost the echo. Um, welcome to the Center for Migration Studies webinar, The Contributions of Refugees to the Nation and the Importance of a Robust U.S. Refugee Program. My name is Rachel Reyes. I'm CMS's Director of Communications. In this webinar, we will discuss the recent report, the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, a return to first principles, how refugees help to define, strengthen, and revitalize the United States, which was commissioned by Catholic Charities USA, Catholic Relief Services, and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Migration Refugee Service. The report is available on our website now at cmsny.org. Um, for today's webinar, Robert Warren, CMS's Senior Fellow, will discuss the methodology underlying the findings detailed in the report. Donald Kerwin, CMS's Executive Director, will further describe refugees' achievements and contributions to the United States, which is also outlined in the report. The next speaker, Carmen Maquillon, Director for Catholic Charities Immigrant Services of the Diocese of Rockville Center, me, um, will provide an on-the-ground perspective on supporting refugees in Long Island. Kevin Appleby, CMS Senior Director on International Migration Policy, will then discuss ways to influence government officials to support the U.S. refugee program. Please note that while you will all be able to hear the panelists, the GoToWebinar platform automatically mutes your line. After the presentations, the call will be open for discussion. To ask a question or make a comment, please make sure you are logged into the GoToWebinar platform and raise your hand using the raise hand feature. I will then call on you and unmute you. If you do not need to speak, you may also enter your comment or question in the chat or question box, and I will read them out loud to the panelists. If you are joining us by telephone only, I will unfortunately not be able to unmute you. So now we'll begin the webinar with our first speaker, Bob Warren. Bob? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, most of the refugee data in this report comes from data collected in the American Community Survey. Our goal was to select data just for refugees from the data collected in the survey. That way we would have all of the data on characteristics of the population that the ACS collects and the data would accurately reflect the refugee population. Uh, in the 30 year period that we examined, 1987 to 2016, the U.S. admitted 2.3 million refugees. Our sample from the ACS had 1.1 million refugees. We believe based on the probability of selection, which I'll describe very briefly, I promise you, um, we, we believe that just over 90% of those that we selected from the ACS actually were refugees. The process of selecting refugees from ACS data uh, at least the beginning of the process, relied on ACS data, I'm sorry, based, relied on DHS data for refugees admitted each year from every country, and also on DHS data for newly arriving LPRs, or legal permanent residents. When, when I say arrivals, I'm always referring to new arrivals. 
and not people who had just its status uh, and arrived in earlier years. Okay, so imagine a matrix with every country down the left margin and year of entry across the top. The cells in that matrix have the ratio of refugees divided by total arrivals based on DHS data. Okay, I'll say that again. The matrix has every country down the left margin and every year of entry across the top. The cells have the ratio of refugees divided by total arrivals. Now, in that matrix, we deleted the ratio in any cell that was less than two thirds refugees. So we kept the ones that were two thirds or more refugees. Next, we used those remaining ratios by country and year of entry to select data in corresponding countries and years of entry from the ACS. That provided the data for this report. Uh, I'll, I'd be glad to answer any questions that I can. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, so we called this report the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, a return to first principles. How refugees help to define, strengthen, and revitalize the United States. And we chose this title because it can be easy to forget why we resettle refugees and how this program serves our interests and reflects our values. And that's what this slide goes to those reasons. The program saves lives, lives of the most vulnerable persons in the world, which is in our national interest and is consistent with our values. This used to be well recognized as President Reagan put it in 1981, the program, quote, continues America's tradition as a land that welcomes people from other countries and that shares the responsibility of welcoming and resettling those who flee oppression. As Arthur Helton put it, it promotes, the program promotes a stable and moral world, as does every act of refugee protection, not just the U.S. resettlement program. It also reduces spontaneous, unregulated migration, and it encourages developing nations, which hosts nearly 90% of the world's refugees, to remain engaged in this important work. And it promotes national security and cooperation from individuals, communities, and nations that are central to U.S. diplomatic, military, and counter-terror strategies. As Bob mentioned, we looked at 1.1 million refugees that arrived between 1987 and 2016, some of them very recently and some more than 30 years ago. And we found that as a group, they had um, integrated quite successfully. Their median household income was $43,000. 35% of them had mortgages, 63% had U.S. born children, 40% were married to U.S. citizens, and more than two thirds had naturalized. We then compared the 1.1 million refugees with comparable non-refugees, foreign born populations, and the total U.S. population, which consists mostly of U.S. citizens. And we found that the refugees labor force participation and employment rates exceeded those of the total U.S. population. 10% of refugees were actually self-employed compared to 9% of the total U.S. population. Their median income equaled that of non-refugees and exceeded the median income of the foreign born overall. And I'm talking about personal income at this point. They were also more likely to be skilled workers than non-refugees or the foreign born. And while they used food stamps and Medicaid at higher rates, public benefit usage among this population fell significantly over time. And the various indicia of refugee integration, well-being, and U.S. family ties increased. These accomplishments are particularly impressive for persons that arrive without any financial resources, or many of them without English language skills, and who are responsible for repaying the travel loans that even brought them to the United States. 
Then we compared refugees who arrived in different periods in that 30-year window, 1987 to 1996, 1997 to 2006, and 2007 to 2016. And not surprisingly, we found that the refugees with the longest residence had integrated more fully than recent arrivals is measured by households with mortgages, English language proficiency, naturalization rates. Naturalization rates grew from 24 to 89% among those groups, two groups. College education, labor force participation, employment and self-employment. I think maybe the most interesting comparison was between those who arrived earliest, in other words, from 1987 to 1996, and the total U.S. population, which, as I said, consists mostly of U.S. citizens. Refugees who arrived in 1987 to 1996 exceed the total U.S. population in median personal income, home ownership, percent above the poverty line, access to a computer and the internet, health insurance, and although it's not listed on this slide, the percent with some college or a college degree. So it's a it's a fairly impressive um, it's a fairly impressive group. And finally, we looked at one national group, that is persons from states in the former Soviet Union who entered from 1987 to 1999, and we reviewed their characteristics both in the year 2000 and again in 2016. And we found that these refugees, uh, for them, their median household income had jumped dramatically from 31,000 to 53,000. Their median personal income had nearly tripled. Households with mortgages jumped from 30 to 40 percent. Public benefit usage fell. English language proficiency rose. The percent with a college degree or some college increased from 68 to 80 percent. 80 percent of this population had attended college. Naturalization rates doubled to 89 percent. Marriage to U.S. citizens rose from 33 to 51 percent. And labor force participation, employment, self-employment, and the rate of skilled workers, they all increased over time as well. And I think what this study shows overall is how successfully this group advanced over time. They're often called a burden. They're often called a threat. And this, this, um, this report shows that that's not the case at all. In fact, they're contributors. Just a couple of, um, beyond the fact that they're effectively integrating, achieving, and contributing, I just wanted to make two final points. One is that refugees are typically very grateful to the country that took them in for the freedom and the opportunity that, that's been provided to them. And they, and they insist on giving back to the country, which is a great thing. And second is our report shows, and this is very clear, they tend to be very entrepreneurial and hardworking as well. So let me stop there and turn it over to Carmen. Thank you. I am going to give you a perspective of um, the kind of work that we do with refugees in um, Long Island. Uh, and Long Island is a community of about 3 million people right outside of New York City. Uh, it comprises two counties, Nassau and Suffolk. Uh, so if you look at the map, it will be like the easternmost part of New York State. Uh, so in, during the past, I would say three to four years, um, most of the refugees that we have provided services to come from Afghanistan, um, Iraq, even though we haven't seen them in the last two years. Um, we have received um, from Uganda, Colombia, Pakistan, just to name a few. Now, the um, uh, Afghanis and the Iraqis, these are what are, what are called SIVs, special immigrants. They are people who have worked for the um, United States government in Afghanistan and Iraq, basically assisting the um, U.S. government and the armed forces as translators, as guides, etc. cetera. Um, about this group, um, I would have to say that they come in already as legal permanent residents, 
but they are still considered refugees for all the services that they receive and also for the reasons they are coming to the United States. They come with um, English, they already know the language because they do speak, they, uh, they work as translators, as, as interpreters. Um, most of them do have at least a college degree. Many of them have advanced degrees. Uh, so when they come to the United States, aside from uh, dealing with the uh, difference in culture, um, sometimes the um, discrimination when it comes to um, um, religion or the way they dress, especially in communities like Long Island, but they can adapt, they have been adapting very easily. Uh, their children, um, these um, um, population, I, I would say within six to seven months are self-sufficient, are becoming self-sufficient again because of the language and the uh, skills that they bring that can easily be adapted to the United States. We have been working with Rohingya refugees, um, the Pakistanis, and there is a group that we have worked very much with, which are the Central American miners. Not the same as the unaccompanied miners, but somewhat related. These are the children of TPS recipients or the um, legal permanent residents in the United States. So uh, they come from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, even though in our case, 99% of those kids that came in uh, were from El Salvador. The program, unfortunately, got canceled. However, we continue to receive uh, these refugees because we did file a couple of um, appeals when their refugee uh, status was denied. As the cases are reviewed and are being approved, we continue to see them. Again, this group um, are coming uh, different to, I would say the difference compared to the unaccompanied minors is that they are coming in most cases with a high school diploma. Some of them speak English. Some of them already have skills that we have received attorneys because the process might have taken long or the um, parents or the spouse of the TPS who was left home, she also managed or he also managed to receive status. So they are coming with um, great skills. Uh, this is a group that um, has been a benefit to us and to the community because it has allowed us to integrate more easily with the rest of the population, with the rest of the Central American population. Some of the services that we provide are, um, aside from just the core services of resettlement, you know, insurance, making sure that they go to school, making sure that they start working and they start preparing towards citizenship. Um, I would say that it has been one of the easiest groups to resettle. Aside from, from that, I want to mention one last group, and, and that is the separated families, even though not officially a refugee group, but it is a group that still comes because of persecution. Um, with the assistance of Catholic Charities and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and MRS, we have been providing services to those families that were separated um, back in April and are beginning to be reunited. Um, we have been providing them with uh, home visits, case management, referral for mental health, referral for health insurance, assistance with school registration, uh, and legal immigration consultation. One of the things that I have to say about these families is the tremendous shock that these children have been living for the past two, three months that they were separated from their caregiver. When they show up at our, our office, we can see what has happened, especially the younger the child, they have become very clingy to their parents or to the caregiver, um, where the parents tell, them, tell us that that's not the way they were before this experience. So it is a group that is going to need uh, probably a lot of um, guidance and um, mental health. We hope to continue to work with them until the last one is released and managed to provide um, you know, the story or their 
situation in front of the immigration judge. But uh, that's more or less what the kind of services that we provide. And I'm sorry I didn't show the second <laughs> slide, which I'm showing it now, so it can give you a brief uh, list of, of some of the countries that the clients that we have seen in the past three years have been coming from. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. I just want to talk a little bit about um, how we might be able to impact uh, the process for establishing the number of refugees that will be resettled over the next fiscal year into 2019, which as many of you may know, has been a source of uh, controversy over the first year and a half of the present administration. Um, we are currently in the process here in Washington of having that presidential determination set or the refugee ceiling, if you will, for FY 2019. And the process normally is a consultation with several agencies within the executive branch uh, with the White House apparatus, particularly Domestic Policy Council. And then a number is submitted to the president for his approval or disapproval. Um, <clears throat> last year, unfortunately, um, the administration came in with the lowest number on record, 45,000, where uh, over you know the last three decades, the average has been up to 95,000 refugees. So it's a significant drop. Um, because of this, there's been extra scrutiny on what the administration will do this year, and there have been reports that there are some intention by some of the administration to lower the refugee ceiling or the presidential determination even lower to 25,000 or even less for next year. Um, and this comes against the backdrop of the current year where the administration will only resettle less than half of the 45,000 that they have uh, pledged to resettle. So it's really a, a critical moment and try to get as much pressure in as possible um, into Congress to get them to support a high number for FY 2019. Uh, there will be a consultation uh, with Congress over the next few weeks by the administration. Usually they sit down and talk to both the chairperson and the ranking member of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. Uh, those haven't been scheduled yet. I think the Supreme Court nomination has pushed them off. But last year there wasn't um, really a formal meeting at all. So this is an encouraging sign that the administration is at least taking in the views of Congress. And in fact, there is a bipartisan letter sent by Senator Grassley and Senator Feinstein asking for a meeting and encouraging higher numbers. So there is some support within Congress for the program and for getting the number higher. Of course, there's not a shortage, there's not a shortage of groups that need resettlement, as we know. Carmen went through, a, went through a few that she has and her diocese have resettled, but there are a large number of refugees, there are 22 million refugees in the in the world, Syrians, uh, the Rohingya, the Venezuelans who are in our own backyard. She mentioned Iraqi and Afghan special immigrants, uh, as well as refugees. And there are other groups, certainly uh, the Congolese and others in Africa that deserve uh, more resettlement. Uh, just a note on those groups is you, we all know the uh, one of the uh, wrenches thrown in the works has been this travel ban, which was recently upheld by the Supreme Court. And that had severely limited certain populations from coming in, including the Syrians, who um, in FY 2018, there were 6,000 that came in before the travel ban took effect. We've only resettled less than 100 uh, to date in, uh, since then. So uh, the travel ban does have an impact on some of these populations, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't advocate for them that the administration can't uh, set up exceptions or even take some of these countries off the list. Um, so we shouldn't be discouraged that the Supreme Court has upheld for certain countries, including Syrians, 
um, Somalis and others um, who are on that list. So what is our messaging going to be uh, over the next three weeks? And, and this advocacy should take place over the next three weeks because the administration is required by September 30th to issue a number to, to assign a presidential, presidential determination. Certainly, many of the numbers that Don spelled out for you on the economic contributions, you should certainly use um, in your advocacy. Um, it's important to counter the argument that refugees are a drain on our <clears throat> public welfare system, that they don't contribute um, and, and, and don't themselves invest in the U.S. economy and develop and integrate. So that should be one talking point. Um, certainly, we should talk about the humanitarian aspects of it and how it saves lives, but also mention <clears throat> how it does facilitate our U.S. foreign policy. <clears throat> In these internal deliberations throughout uh, the administration, the State Department, as well as the Defense Department, have been supporters of the program because they promote our foreign policy aspects. In other words, they give us the soft power to influence countries to do similar humanitarian contributions. And it gives us leverage, the moral power, if you will, the moral capital to help um, respond to crises around the world. So it's important for our foreign policy, but also our national security interests, as Don mentioned. Um, certainly if we were, to, as we deny certain countries or cert certainly certain religions from being resettled, it, it certainly gives fodder to those extremists to say that the U.S. is an enemy. Um, but also if we forsake those who may have helped us in conflict, uh, like the special immigrant visas, um, then the next time this comes around, we certainly would not be helped by those on the ground who we uh, left unprotected after the war is over. So that's another sort of example of how our national security is, is uh, enhanced through this program. We also want to certainly mention that refugees go through the more background checks and any entry into the United States. And the administration has even added more steps to this vetting system. And finally, one point that I failed to mention on the slide, but is important, it would be your second overall message is that the administration should make every good faith effort and Congress should hold them accountable to meet the ceiling that they set, not to leave it at 22,000 when you have a 45,000 number to me. It's, it, the analogy is uh, leaving, uh, leaving seats empty on the, on the lifeboats from the Titanic. You could have brought people and saved lives, but you left them empty. <clears throat> that there needs to be some accountability there, some oversight, so that they don't slow walk the program, if you will. <clears throat> and have a de facto number, which is, which is far less than what they make in the presidential determination. So what, what can you do? What um, steps can you take? First of all, we just posted a, a postcard, uh, which is easy to, um, to send through our, um, our overall network, the Scalabrity International Migration Network website. It's sim dash global.org. You can go on that website and put in some information and send a postcard to both your representatives and Congress supporting the program. Uh, you all also, if you if you really want to emote, you can call directly to your member of Congress or to the Senate um, or to the White House and, and express support um, for for the program. We've set a number of 75,000 for FY 2019, which is a number that is very achievable uh, by the network uh, and by the country, and one that we think at least meets the immediate humanitarian needs out there with the many refugee comp, uh, crises that are going on in the world. So we encourage you to do that, and if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to, to send it to us, and we can help shepherd that. Um, some important websites for information, of course, ours certainly has uh, the Refugee Report and other resources. Uh, Refugee Council USA is, has um, several resources you can use, as well as a, a refugee tracker to tell you uh, how many refugees have been resettled against the cap this year. Um, 
So those hopefully will be some tools that you can use. Uh, over the next three weeks are important, as I mentioned, because the president will determine the number of refugees by September 30th. And then after that, of course, we need to ensure that the money is appropriated, but that, that's for a later time. So thank you, and we'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, everyone. So we now welcome your comments and questions. Again, the GoToWebinar platform has automatically muted your line. Um, so to ask a question or make a comment, please make sure you're logged into GoToWebinar um, and raise your hand using the raise hand feature. If you're calling in, um, in addition to being logged in, you also need to enter your audio pin. Uh, in, and so once you raise your hand, I will then call on you and unmute you. If you do not need to speak, you can also enter your comment or question in the chat or question box, and I will read them out loud for the panelists. Uh, if you are joining us by phone only, I will unfortunately not be able to unmute you. So the first question that I have received is, um, what were the names of the senators that you mentioned? Remember? The, the, the senators in terms of the consultation? Or? Somebody is from Gabrielle Fernandez, and I've asked her to. Well, I mean, certainly you, you contact your own senator from where you're from. Um, you can go on our website, and it will automatically, if you sign the postcard and, and give your address, it will automatically send that postcard to your representatives. Uh, your representative and your senators. Um, Sorry, she just clarified that uh, the senators for the bipartisan bill they wrote, wrote the bill and asked for a meeting. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The, le the letter was from uh, that I mentioned was from Senator Grassley and Senator Feinstein. Uh, Senator Grassley is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator Feinstein is the ranking member. So they they wrote a a, a letter to. Um, the president about the, the program and the need for them to consult with them on the program. <clears throat> and that should happen ideally, hopefully in the next week or two. Okay, I'm going to unmute Dustin Cooper. Okay, Dustin, are you there? Yep, I'm here. I was actually just needed to write in a comment. I was just wondering if there was any information updated regarding the proposals to PRM from the nine volunteer agencies. What proposals in terms of numbers or in terms of uh, groups that we are targeting? Also, uh, I'm not sure if this is information you're aware of, but we've been told that not all nine volunteer agencies uh, would be approved by PRM next year. So I was wondering if you had any uh, regarding that. Yeah, we we haven't we weren't part of that um, consultation only because we're not a resettlement agency. Mm -hmm. uh, but with there has been discussion uh, that because the numbers are so low that the State Department might not use all the resettlement agencies, but that's as far as I know, and I don't want to speculate on where that is actually right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll have to meet you in a second. The next question was, um, could someone recap Again, the economic benefits of refugees and the counter arguments to refugees being an economic burden. Sure, I think um, the kind of the two ways that we could maybe you could get those slides up, Rachel, um, or I could. The two I think the two um, that are most telling is the is not this one, but. Is, is to actually compare refugees who arrived at different periods over that 30-year period and, um, and how they've progressed over time to contribute. And so if you take the, um, if you take the 1987 to 1996 cohort, the group that arrived earliest, and you compare them to the total U.S. population, and that's not refugees, that's obviously mostly citizens, what you find is that they is that they do very they do very well. Um, I sh that's not the right slide either. Sorry. 
but that they um, that basically their median personal income is greater, their home ownership is greater, the percent above the poverty line is greater, the access to a computer is greater, the percent with a college degree or attendance at some college is greater as well. And then um, if you if you compare refugees who arrived at different periods, you find that they actually progress very significantly over time. So what this slide shows is that the refugees with the longest residence have integrated more fully than recent arrivals. So the you jump from home ownership from 19% to the from the most recent cohort to 41% that arrived at the earliest uh, 10 year period. English language proficiency jumps, naturalization rates triple or quadruple, college education doubles, labor force participation increases as does employment, self-employment. And then um, we looked at one refugee group and it was remarkable how well they did. And that was, a, that was people from states in the former Soviet Union. And we looked at that. Th these are people who arrived from 87 to 99. We looked at them in the year 2000 and then we looked at them again in the year 2016. And this is the kind of jump that in that 16 year period that this one population made. Median household income increased from 31,000 to 53,000. Personal income nearly tripled. Mortgages, you know, home ownership increased and on and on. And you can, you can, we'll, we'll, we'll happily share these slides. These are gonna be posted somewhere, right, Rachel? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's the case that for how well refugees do. And, how little a burden they are to the U.S. and what contributors they are. And I might, I, I just, I just want to say that, and I think that this is an important point too, which is you hear a lot of reports to the contrary. What our report um, cites are all the credible reports, which are totally and completely consistent with our findings. But there are people that have that release very outcome-oriented reports. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to demonstrate that refugees are a burden. And the way that they do that is that they just look at refugees in the early years after their arrival. Um, you know, and that's when their um, economic contributions are lowest, of course, and their public benefits are highest. And then they also, um, some of them count the education of refugee children, for example, as a fiscal cost but they don't consider their long-term contributions to the nation's economy. In other words, these reports, they really cook the books and they're, and they're designed to, to make refugees look like a burden. And um, you know, don't count their contributions, don't count their tax contributions, don't count their business ownership, don't count any of that. So I think that those are not credible reports and those are, that's what you, you might hear about those types of reports too in the press, but. They're, they're reports that are, you know, um, they're ideological and ideologically driven. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually unmute uh, Bob um, because I have a qu we have a question for you. Let me just pull up oh, that I, question. I... <coughs> uh, sorry, it's been, okay. Um, where was it? Is the ACS the only survey data available to study the resettlement outcomes of refugees on large scale? Are there other data on refugees available? Uh, I'm sure there are other data available. I'm not familiar with it. The reason that we chose the American Community Survey is that it is an absolutely huge survey uh, covering roughly 1% of the entire US population. So um, it has small sampling variation and, and covers the entire population. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. Of, I, I don't think uh, surveys like the Census Bureau's um, current population survey probably wouldn't be large enough to, to look at the refugee population nationwide. Um, so I think the American Community Survey is probably, in terms of survey data, uh, is the best data. There must be other sources of information about refugees that I'm not, I'm not aware of. 
Um, having said that, Rachel, I'd like to make a quick comment on what Don just said about the Soviet Union. We looked at their characteristics in 2000, and then again, uh, 16 years later. We did a seminar uh, last months ago, and someone asked a question about the median household income and the, and the median personal income. And the question was, have those been adjusted for inflation? And the answer is no. So um, those comparisons would, would be a little closer. That is, um, household income increasing from 31,000 to 53,000. If you adjust the 31,000 for inflation, those would be somewhat closer, but you would still, the, the, the conclusion would still be the same. So I just wanted to uh, add to those comments. Thanks, Bob. Um, so another question, are there any changes to what aid is offered 30 and 20 years ago to now regarding support for refugees that would lead to a prior group doing better than groups arriving later? Did the study look at that? Uh, I'm sorry, was that a question for me, Rachel? It's, a, it's in terms of the benefits that refugees get. Yeah. Okay. Um, the only um, benefit that has been provided to refugees is an increase on the money that can be spent towards them um, that it went from $250 to $450 to now $1,125. That is the total amount that the government provides um, in order for a resettlement agency to, um, to do the resettlement process. This money can go towards food, clothing, uh, rent, etc. Um, sure, this does not count. The first six months or eight months that they will be entitled to seek or to receive Medicaid or health insurance and also food stamps as long as they need it. Okay, our next question is, do you have... Uh, I also would like to add the uh, Match Grant Program, which is an, an early employment program that is provided or is available to refugees who are willing uh, ready and able to go to work. Uh, and in this case, uh, that program, they can participate in, in that program for an additional uh, six months from the day that they enter. So it's 180 days. In that case, we can assist them with uh, the cooperation of the federal government. We will pay the rent, um, transportation, food, uh, as long as they are willing to be employed or start employment within those 180 days. Thank you. Mm. Okay, the next question um, is, do you have evidence that refugees have access to the type of employment that reflects their academic and professional qualifications? How can this be facilitated? I don't know if there's been any studies done on that, but um, you know there have been examples of uh, refugees and others who are professionals um, who have professionals and that they're professionally trained, such as doctors or um, uh, attorneys or other types of professions, where they might encounter underemployment upon their initial resettlement, um, especially I think with the um, SIV you know, population, and Carmen might have some other examples. Um, over the long term, you know, I don't know what their outcomes are if they're able to work their way back to where their um, jobs are commensurate with their skill levels, but did you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the um, uh, groups that uh, I would say is highly affected would be the SIVs, the special immigrants. However, working with other organizations like Upperly Global that helps um, refugees who have some type of um, foreign credentials or, or professional um, degrees to validate them here. Uh, at the beginning, in the first year, it is almost impossible for them to secure a job at that level. However, little by little, especially those that have come or who have experience as 
interpreters or translators, at least in our office, we have managed to secure um, employment as translators at the you know, state and local court because as, as they come in from this country, so that language, they come to populations so or to those communities that are also in need of that language ability. Um, many of them find or find themselves self-employed. Um, Uber is, a, is a, a, a high demonstration of where many of the refugees are seeking employment, especially for those that have the skill of, uh, you know, um, computer savvy, they, have, they know the language, and maybe they come from cities where New York will be easily adapted to them. It's a, I think, Carmen, it's, it's a lot of credentialing problems, really, for, sure. for of these groups. And it takes, it takes a while because the credentialing rules are fractured. There's not kind of a central place. It's not that, equivalent. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then also, just to emphasize, and this goes to the public benefit question, too, that this is a very lean program. There's not a lot of money provided to refugees. There's not a lot of resources. And it's still despite some other models, it's still mostly about self-sufficiency through early employment. And, and refugees take what jobs that they can, they can get to get started in the U.S. Okay, so um, a question on welfare programs. What welfare programs do refugees generally use and for how long? How does that compare to other populations of Americans? Um, I can only speak to for Long Island, um, the, the refugee program that we that we run. Um, refugees are entitled to or have the opportunity to apply for food stamps, for cash assistance, for Medicaid, uh, if they are in need of that. Our job has always been to try to work with them in trying to obtain self-sufficiency at the earliest possible moment. In our office, the um, experience has been that within a year, 80% or more of the refugees that we resettle are, are self-sufficient and not dependent on public assistance. Um, I cannot speak for all the parts of the state, I also have to say that Long Island has a very low unemployment rate, which is below 4%, and that has been the case for a couple of years. Um, so that might also contribute to the low dependency on public assistance. Okay, I have questions from Sanai Gebramadine. Um, Sanai, I've unmuted you if you want to just ask all those questions that you posed. Are you there? Okay, so I guess, um, well, in any event, so Sanai Gabriel Medin asks, would it be possible for the panel to forecast or give us any insight on what to expect for the next fiscal year regarding refugee resettlement? In terms of the numbers? Is that the question? And just for, just would it be possible for the panel forecast or give us any insight? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, uh, given given some of the reports out there, there there's a, certainly a, a drive by some within the administration to reduce the the, the president's determination. Um, certainly, there's been what we've heard is there's been pushback by certain parts of the government against that. Um, you know, if if I think we have to anticipate that that the presidential determination may be lower than last year. Um, um, if, if, if it remains the same, that it will be a victory. I, I think we also, the, the second part of it is is meeting whatever ceiling he puts up. I mean, that's really a lot, of, in a lot of ways, where the battle is in terms of ensuring that the administration resettles the number that they say they're going to resettle um, because, you know, they might have a certain number, which one government official described to me as aspirational, and then they have a number that they want to resettle. So, I mean, I think 
to be perfectly honest, if I had to guess, we would be in sort of in the same numbers that we're seeing this year in terms of who comes through the door. And it's incumbent upon us and others to pressure the administration to bring more in. Um, so I don't want to give an exact number, but we're, we're certainly not going to see an increase, I don't think, at least at this point, um, in terms of the presidential determination. But we do have some uh, leverage in trying to get them to increase the numbers they bring in, um, you know, the practical numbers that they bring in. Could I, could I just go back quick, just really quickly to let people know that we do have um, statistics on usage of food stamps, Medicaid and Medicare, and compare um, the usage of refugees in those three different eras or those three different cohorts to the total U.S. population. That's in table one of our report, if you want to look at that. Basically, they use fewer and fewer benefits over time, but still more than the total U.S. population in those of those benefits. And um, Rachel, I think that people can find this report on our website. Mm -hmm. So you all know what that is, www.cmsny.org. Okay, the next question, um, I'm actually going to jump to Florence Deacon uh, because it's a public benefits question as well. She read recently that some immigrants are not using public benefits because that might cause difficulties for them getting legal status or green cards. Does that apply to refugees? Um, it's, it's not supposed to apply to refugees. However, um, most refugees, when they hear this, they become uh, very afraid. And we have seen it in our office where people are refusing to um, receive the, you know, or go for the WIC program or other benefits that they might be entitled to. Uh, it is also uh, a topic of uh, discussion that I have with uh, some local attorneys, immigration attorneys, who seem to, uh, in some cases, just advise everybody not to go for the benefits. Uh, I look at it that is, if they are entitled to by law and they need those benefits, that it is up to us to fight for the rights of the refugees to continue to rely on those services as long as they need it. It is also our responsibility and the refugee responsibility that if they can become self-sufficient, if they can go to work and not depend on the benefits, to also do it. it it's, the concern is related to the proposed rule that's coming up related to the public charge ground, yes. which don't apply to refugees. It certainly is going to be a, that is something that we're waiting for, though, in other contexts, because that's going to likely be a very, very broad rule that's going to even take into account things like benefit usage by U.S. citizen children. Yes. And, the, and the, the threat of this rule has had a chilling effect sure. um, on immigrants, and I don't know if it's impacted refugees, even though they wouldn't be, um, to prevent people from signing up because they'll be concerned that they'll be denied status. Well, one example is the um, Haitian parolees that have been coming into the United States, they are being paroled in order to wait here for the priority date of a family petition. At that moment, they are entitled to receive services. However, when they go and apply for a green card a couple of years from now, that relative still has to prepare that affidavit of support. And we are looking into how are those benefits that they receive when they first enter, is that going to impact the adjustment of status application, which is not a regular adjustment of status that every refugee or parolee goes through. This is a family petition at the end of the day. Okay, the next question is from Rana Sharafa. Can you please explain a bit more how national security is facilitated through accepting refugees? Would you say it strengthens national security and why? Well, it's, you know, those interpreters, for example, they were working, you know, with the, with the U.S. Armed Forces. And um, so you have refugees coming over who are fleeing, you know, conditions that are 
are they're fleeing terrorists and they're fleeing those kinds of conditions first of all so their orientation isn't you know to the orientation is to provide for their families and themselves a secure environment but also their language abilities are absolutely crucial in terms of some of the military intelligence and diplomatic work that's being done by the United States so in that way they're furthering security as well and also cooperating with you know law enforcement um, in the context of you know maybe people that could be a threat in the United States I think the uh, the other key thing though the, the main point to make here is this isn't really an appropriate way to describe refugees at all because the people that are coming in are the most carefully screened people um, of any um, group in the United States by far and by any refugee population in the world so that you know this is not if there's any question at all about people they're not they're not being admitted in and in fact you know they've gone overboard on that and have excluded a lot of people a great risk to them and to their and to their families who could easily come into the United States. So it's a it's a highly securitized and secure program. And refugees, when they do come in, they they benefit security in you know various ways. And all that also serve in the armed forces ultimately a lot of them. So yeah, it also generates goodwill around the world. Um, right. You know, it it creates goodwill among populations. Um, who may have been displaced uh, in a conflict of which we were a part, um, and uh, it it allows um, well it pre it prevents extremists and certain from manipulating uh, these populations or pointing to evidence that the U.S. doesn't care about their countries. Um, this is an example of where we do care and can uh, sort of neutralize any uh, other forces that are saying that we don't. Um, for example, the travel ban could be used by extremist groups in the Middle East to, as, an ex as a recruiting poster tool um, to say that the U.S. is the enemy. Um, so uh, overall, it's, it generates goodwill and also it also provides leverage for our country to encourage other countries to respond on a humanitarian basis. It gives us some moral suasion, um, you know, some moral power to encourage uh, responsibility sharing, which is really the only way that you're really ever going to get the roots of refugee crises around the world. Yeah, and I, I might just add, too, that kind of conversely, and don't trust us, go to ask national security experts or look in some of our reports on what people like Michael Chertoff and others say about refugee protection and all of the various aspects of refugee protection from return programs to addressing refugee producing conditions to the resettlement programs and integrating people into host communities. All of that stuff is regarded by security experts. It's something that advances security. So any act of refugee protection is a pro-security act. And that's understood by national security experts. We've got um, three more minutes. I've got one, well, it's a multi-parter from Sanai Gibran Medin again. Um, with the reduction in new arrivals, should we expect a reshift in service provision from recent arrivals to long-term refugees, like relicensing or recertification? And then the, um, he also had another question. Can you possibly talk about ORR's Career Pathways Grant? Not, um, I'm not um, familiar with the ORR Career Pathways. But is the, is the first question um, how the refugee programs will be changed as a result of decreased arrivals? Is that what that means? Mm -hmm. Well, they, um, what, if any, would there be a reshift in service provision? from recent arrivals to long-term refugees? There's, there's, not, there's not federal funding for long-term services to refugees, I think, is one, is one way to look at it. I mean, another issue is like what, I guess the issue really goes to how, how does the refugee resettlement staff kind of shift in terms of what they're doing or just go away? Yeah. 
Um, one of the things that I can mention is that um, many offices will be closed, especially when the government uh, has indicated that um, each office, in order to remain open, has to resettle at least 100 refugees per year, and there should be no second resettlement office within 50, a 50 mile or 100 mile radius. So that will affect um, many, uh, many offices. Uh, the other part is that, um, sure, if there is no local resettlement agency to take care of those refugees, uh, it falls upon the state to perhaps provide the assistance. For those living in New York, uh, the lucky ones that live in New York, New York is very, very committed to the refugee population, but not every state um, will have the same benefits. So it remains to be seen at this moment. Okay, okay so thank you all for joining us today. Um, for more information and to download the report as well as view the recording of this presentation, you just need to visit our website at cmsny.org. I'll have the presentation up um, later this afternoon. If you also have any questions, feel free to contact me at cms at cmsny.org. And thank you to all of our panelists and have a great rest of your day.